Greetings Earthlings, today I'm back with a review of another audio interface. That interface being the Universal Audio Twin X Duo. If you are interested in this interface, it will cost you around $1,100. Like always, I'll throw some links down below. And I do want to quickly note what the difference between the Twin X Duo and the Twin X Quad is. It is simply a difference in the processing power that the interfaces have. The Twin will be less powerful, meaning it can run fewer plugins, and the Quad will be able to run more plugins. And another quick note, the reason that these interfaces are so expensive is because they also have processors in them that allow you to offload the processing from your computer onto the interface and also decrease the latency so you can hear almost in real time what you're doing to your audio signal with the plugins. But with those notes out of the way, I will be recording at 24-bit 48 kilohertz. The microphone is the Rode NT1. My gain is set at 32 dB. B. I am not doing any kind of processing, no DSP currently, and I will not do any kind of post processing, but I may have to boost it a little bit in post, so make sure to check the doobly doo to see what I diddly did. And now let's talk about what comes in the box. What a surprise, you are going to get the audio interface, you will get the power cable, a quick start URL guide on how to register your interface. You also get a number of free plugins with the purchase of your audio interface, but that is always changing. So make sure to check Universal's website for the deals and what kind of plugins you're getting. And you do not get a cable to connect this device to your computer. You need to buy that separately. I want to make that abundantly clear. If you are buying this audio interface, you need to buy a Thunderbolt 3 to Thunderbolt 3 cable to connect it to your computer. All USB-C cables are not Thunderbolt 3, so make sure you read the documentation of the cable that you're buying to make sure you're getting the right cable. I want to make that abundantly clear. Then as far as the build quality of this interface, it feels absolutely outstanding. It has an all metal body which acts as a heat sink, so when you're doing a bunch of processing, it does get a little bit toasty, but it feels incredibly robust. The big dial on the front does not have too much wobble to it, feels really nice. The XLR cables also have no wobble to them, all around a very well put together interface. And if this at all matters to you, this interface appears to be made in Malaysia. Then on the left of the face, you have meters for your input channel 1 and 2, and it will also tell you which channel you're adjusting. It will also tell you what level you're inputting to the interface, whether that be mic, line, or high Z. Then directly below that meter, you have the preamp button. This will select the preamp so you can adjust that with the big dial and also adjust which channel you're controlling. Then in the center of this interface, you have the massive dial, which is how you're going to adjust pretty much everything on this interface. It also has a light around it to indicate what level you are actually adjusting, which will change as you go between your microphone and preamp channels and your monitor and headphone output. Then on the right hand side of the face, you will find your output meters and this will tell you what the output level is for your monitors or your headphone output. And it will also tell you whether you're adjusting the monitor or the headphone level. Beneath that meter, you have the monitor button and that will allow you to select whether you are adjusting your headphones or if you're adjusting the monitors. Then in between that preamp button and the monitor button, you have a series of lights and more buttons that will allow you to control a bunch of additional stuff depending on if you're controlling the input or the output. When you are adjusting the input, the first button will change the input level from mic to line. If you plug in a high Z input to channel one, that will automatically change. The second button will engage a high pass filter. The third button will engage the 48 volts phantom power for the channel you have selected. The fourth button will engage a negative 20 decibel pad. The fifth button will invert the phase in case you have any kind of phase issues. And the last button will link the two channels together to create a single stereo source so you don't have any kind of level mismatch. Then when you have the output or monitor section selected, the first button will engage the talkback microphone. We'll test that a little bit later. The second button will dim your monitor output volume. You do select the amount of dim or the amount of attenuation in the Universal Audio console software. 
Then the third and the fourth button are kind of weird and they only work in a certain setup. I don't have that specific setup right now, so I'm not able to demonstrate that. The fifth button will allow you to sum your mix to mono in your monitors to check for phase issues. This will not affect the playback in your headphones. And lastly, you have a mute, a mute button, a mute button, which again will mute your monitors, but will not affect your headphones. Then when we look at the front of the interface, you have a quarter inch high Z input for your instrument, and this will take over channel one, meaning you cannot use a microphone in the channel one preamp simultaneously with the instrument input. And then you have a quarter inch headphone output, which does allow for zero latency monitoring, but you will likely need to read the manual and watch some tutorials on Universal Audio's website to get the playback working properly because it can be a little bit confusing. Then on the rear of the interface, you have two XLR quarter inch combination jacks. Then you'll find two quarter inch balanced outputs for your monitors. Then you'll find two line level outputs to run out of your DAW to some external audio gear if you want to. Then you have a power input that is locking. This is where you'll connect your audio interface to the power supply. Next, you will find an on off switch, thank goodness. You will find a Toslink or Toslink input, which accepts ADAT or SPDIF. And then you'll find a Thunderbolt 3 connector. Then as far as the specs, this is not a USB interface. This is a Thunderbolt 3 interface, which means your computer needs to have Thunderbolt 3 for it to work. It records up to 24 bit, 192 kilohertz. The preamps have a max gain of 65 dB. They have a dynamic range of 123 dBA. You get 48 volts of phantom power. On screen right here, I have a bit of the high Z and align input specs. If you want to look at that, here are the output specs for the headphones and the monitor outputs, if that matters to you. And then as far as the digital inputs and outputs, the ADAT can accept up to eight additional channels at 48 kilohertz, two channels at 192 kilohertz, and the SPDIF can accept up to two additional channels up to 96 kilohertz. Now, in order to really test out the interface's preamps, I have the Shure SM7B connected directly to the TwinX Duo. No fed head, no cloud lifter, directly into the interface. My gain is set at 55 dB, and I'm hitting around negative 12 to negative 9 dB, which is plenty loud enough. And I will be quiet so you can hear what kind of noise is generated with the preamp set up like this. And in case you're an incredibly quiet talker, now I have increased the gain to 65 dB and I am about clipping. If I get loud, I clip. Sounds terrible, but I will be quiet so you can hear how much noise is on the 7B with the gain 100%. Now I want to go ahead and measure the preamp noise of this interface using a 150 ohm resistor to emulate a dynamic microphone. So let's go ahead and do that. Then as far as latency, with my sample rate set at 48 kilohertz and an IO buffer of 64 samples, we have a 13 millisecond round trip or a two and a half millisecond output. Jumping up to 128 samples, we have 15 and a half millisecond round trip or 3.7 millisecond output. And jumping up to 256 samples, we have a 21 millisecond round trip latency or a six and a half millisecond output latency. Now with my sample rate set at 192 kilohertz and an IO buffer size of 64 samples, we have a three and a half millisecond round trip or 0.6 millisecond output latency. 
When we jump up to 128 samples, we have 4 millisecond round trip or 1 millisecond output. Jumping up to 256, we have a 5.5 millisecond round trip or 1.5 millisecond output. Now I'm going to connect my guitar and bass directly to the instrument input on the interface. I will play the DI raw unprocessed signal so you can hear how it sounds. Then I'll engage an amp simulator and then I will play a full mix. Then as far as the headphone amp quality, I don't do any kind of fancy measurements like Julian Krauss. Go check him out if you want that kind of stuff. But as far as the power, I am perfectly capable to drive the HD 650s plenty loud enough and it's what I do every single day. The Twin X is my daily driver and I use it all the time with Sennheiser HD 650s and it has never been too quiet. All right. Now we have pressed the talk button and you are listening to the talkback microphone, the built-in talkback mic, which is the pinhole microphone directly below the main dial. I am maybe one and a half to two feet away. This is probably how it would be used. This interface sitting on a desk, somebody in another room singing or playing their instrument. You press this down and say, hey, you suck, do it again. And they can hear you. Does it sound good? No, it's not meant to. It's meant to serve a purpose. It's meant to be a utility. I just wanted to include a sample because I know somebody is going to be curious about it, and there you go. That's the talkback microphone. Do not use it unless it's for an effect or unless you're screaming at somebody in the studio for being bad at what they do. Okay, more tests or something else now. Now, I am not going to do an entire walkthrough of the Universal Audio Console software. Otherwise, we would be here for two or three hours, and Universal Audio has done some amazing tutorials and walkthroughs on their YouTube channel. So if you have a Universal Audio interface and want to learn this, 100% go and watch the tutorials on their YouTube channel. But what I wanted to do is just throw on a couple of different unison preamps I have and maybe a couple of compressors while the cars outside are way too loud and to maybe show you a couple of the sounds that you're able to get out of the same microphone just with a plug-in from Universal Audio. So first up, we are completely raw, no unison preamps, nothing is on there. My gain is set at 32 dB and this is the Rode NT1 and here is how it is sounding. Now I have a 610 preamp in the unison pre section. The tube preamp section is set to plus 10, so we are getting the most tube saturation as we can. Nothing has changed in the pad, the EQ, any of that, and the level is set to 5. And this is the kind of sound that you can get. If it's too dark, you can brighten it up with something like that. Way too aggressive just to show you what it does. I would never, never do that. But that is the 610, and a quick note on why you would want to use the Unison preamps. Let me shut this off. It's because the Unison preamps actually adjust the impedance of the microphone input to closely match the impedance of the actual interface that you're using or the actual interface that they are modeling. So it gets you a much more accurate representation of that clone. So that is why you would want to use the unison preamp as opposed to just putting it in as an insert. 
Now I have my microphone running through the Avalon 737, 737SP. And here you go. I have everything bypassed. Nothing is going on here. We may be able to give it a little bit more gain. Let's go ahead and do that. A bit more gain. You got all the EQ. You got the compressor. All of that fun stuff. We're not doing any of that. Just a quick down and dirty switch between a bunch of preamps. There's the Avalon for you. Let's do one or two more. Now I have the Neve 88RS preamp turned on. Again, we are bypassing everything on here in terms of EQ. This is just the raw preamp, and my gain is set to 39 dB on this one. And I will level match all of these in post as close as I can, but there you go, another example, and I think we have one more that we can try out. And the last preamp that we have is the SSL, the Solid State Logic 4000E channel strip. This has dynamics, meaning compression. It has an expander. I believe it also has a gate. It has EQ. It has all of that stuff. We are bypassing all of it and only using the preamp right now. What a tragedy. But there you go. Another preamp that you can emulate. Is it going to get you the exact same sound as the actual analog interface? Probably not. But it is going to get you darn close for a heck of a lot cheaper. And the last thing that I wanted to do was demonstrate my most used plugin, the LA2A Silver. I use this every single week on my podcast. I love this compressor with all of my being. Let me go ahead and engage it. And here you go. We're getting 3 to 5 dB of gain reduction. And I just love how this thing sounds. It's so gooey. It's so rich. It's maybe not the best compressor ever, but I love the character that it imparts. And there you go. That's pretty much all that I wanted to demonstrate in the console software. You can do so much with it, but there is simply too much for me to cover in a review. Make sure to check Universal Audio's YouTube channel to learn how to actually use it. And check their website to see all of the plugins that there are. And also I want to make a note that if you are buying the Universal Audio stuff to dive deep into the plugin ecosystem, they are expensive. They are incredibly expensive. They are the most expensive plugins that I've ever come across. Are they worth it? I can't say that for you. I have found a lot of them very, very useful, but a lot of them I have purchased and then not used. So just go in knowing that if you're buying a bunch of plugins, it's going to add up. Maybe wait because they do have sales throughout the year. Doesn't make them cheap, but they're still a little bit more affordable than they typically are. So I wanted to make that note as well that these plugins are so dang expensive. As far as interfaces go, I think that this may be my favorite interface, or at least it's my most used interface. And first up in terms of pros, the plugins. That is the main draw to Universal Audio, gaining access to this plugin library of outstanding emulations of analog gear that none of us will ever have access to. It's an amazing asset to have. Is it cheap? No. But are they great? Yes. So that is the main draw and the biggest pro for the Universal Audio stuff. The preamps in this thing are also incredibly powerful with 65 dB of gain, and they're very clean. The conversion, great. I have no complaints there, no issues, never had any complaints about it. Then you got the latency. We had sub one millisecond latency running into the computer and back out. That's crazy. So the latency on this thing is great. Also, the headphone amp is capable of driving even the HD 650s with plenty of room to spare. And I love that they kept the physical controls for the most part. It would have been easy to make everything digital, but having access to all of the physical dials and buttons makes it a lot easier to make adjustments while you're not looking at what you're doing. But after a year of using it, you get very familiar with what buttons do what, and you're able to control everything manually without paying attention to it. Really glad they didn't go fully digital there. But then as far as cons, the main drawback that I see is the limited compatibility with this thing. I don't have first-hand experience with trying to run Universal Audio on Windows, but from what I've heard from a couple of people I know who have bought in, 
it seems very difficult and not fully flushed out, very buggy and inconsistent. That's just what I have heard. Don't take my word for it. Go try to find somebody who uses Windows, who's reviewed Universal Audio and take their word for it. I would just be skeptical of buying into a multi-thousand dollar setup and system without knowing that it's going to be incredibly stable. Secondly, the lack of a Thunderbolt 3 cable in the box isn't terrible, but it's a real kick in the pants. You're spending a thousand plus dollars on an interface, and if you didn't do your proper research and you don't know that it does not come with a cable, you're going to get home and you're going to be pissed off. You're going to hate everything because you're going to think, well, now how do I connect this to my computer? I don't have a cable. They should include a Thunderbolt 3 cable for the price. It's a thousand bucks, 1100 bucks. Give me a cable. Also, even though I said that plugins were a pro for this interface, I think the pricing of the plugins is a con because you will find plugins that are $300 and they don't have to deliver anything to you. It's not a physical device. It's a piece of code and they're charging 300 bucks for it. And it's just, it's difficult to stomach. I understand the difficulty that goes into tracking down this historical, difficult to find analog gear, finding the best examples of it and emulating it as well as they do, but it's still difficult to swallow a pill that says, you're paying $300 for one plugin. <laughs> That's very difficult to, to deal with. And lastly, it's less of a con and more of a note. Just like the Universal Audio Arrow, this does not play well with Discord. So if you are buying this for some kind of conferencing software, if you're on Mac, I highly recommend using something like Loopback Audio, which allows you to create a new aggregate device to send to that piece of software. That has been my solution for the Universal Audio stuff and using it with Discord, and it's worked perfectly for me once I installed it and got it set up. So would I recommend the Universal Audio Apollo Twin X? Both yes and no. I know, what a cop-out. As far as no, if you're using Windows, I would be a little bit hesitant of buying into a multi-thousand dollar system. I really think that before investing multiple thousands of dollars in a system, you should find somebody who has Windows, who runs it as their main production PC, and has a good experience with the Universal Audio stuff. If you're going Thunderbolt 3, I think there are some serious issues with Thunderbolt 3 and Windows, so I probably would steer clear of it if that's you. But on the other hand, if you're a Mac user and the computer you use has a Thunderbolt 3 port and you want access to that amazing plugin library, you want a couple of microphone pre's, and you need the SPDIF or ADAT expansion, then absolutely I recommend this thing. It is such an amazing centerpiece. But if you do not need the SPDIF expansion, maybe you're not going to be doing too much in terms of processing. Maybe you're just a solo podcaster then maybe the UA Arrow would be a better option for you because you won't need that SPDIF or ADAT expansion and you won't be running entire sessions with dozens or hundreds of UA plugins so you don't need a bunch of processing power. That's who I would recommend it for and I'm just going to continue to use this until the day it dies because I am bought completely in on the UA ecosystem. I think that's going to wrap up for today, but I would love to hear from you. What do you think of the Twin X? If you have Mac, is this something you're considering? If you have Windows, have you used this? If so, has it been stable? Let me know in the comments down below. If you found this video fun, interesting, or helpful, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Hated it? Big old thumbs down. Want more videos? Go ahead and subscribe. Click that logo down beneath me, and don't forget to hit that bell icon. Want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here? You can do so by clicking that join button or going to patreon.com slash podcastage and joining at the $5 tier or higher. It really does help me continue to bring you these videos. So until next time, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. 